Hello and welcome to this introductory guide on how to use Ancestry. My name is Jacob, I've been with Ancestry about two years now. Uh, I'm not a genealogist, I work in the member services department, which means that whenever you're calling us or emailing us or chatting with us here on Facebook, um, it's me or one of my colleagues that you're talking to. So while I'm not a genealogist, I do have a lot of experience using the website and I was asked to give a bit of an introductory guide uh, of the basics on how to get started. Um, and if you're a complete beginner, I'll also recommend some articles uh, at the end and in the video description that will go through all of this in more detail. So this is a bit of a quick run through. Genealogy is one of those subjects that's often self-taught, especially, you know, using our website. So even someone with more experience might find just some part of the website that they're not used to using. Uh, I think it might be useful to most people. And at the end, I'll also throw in some general troubleshooting tips, which again, for uh, whenever your family tree breaks, it might be good to refer to those, which can easily happen as it grows bigger. So um, I'll also challenge you to guess by the end of this video, what my accent is. It's the number one question I get asked when I'm talking to people on the phone. So uh, please leave your guesses in the comments now, and I'll know if you cheated. So this is Ancestry.co.uk. Um, it will look about the same whether you're using Ancestry.com, Ancestry.ca. Uh, all the same tips should apply, but I'm using Co.uk because I'm in Ireland. So you can click here to sign in. And if you don't have an account yet, you can simply uh, click here, sign up today for free. And the only thing you need to create an account on our website is an email address. So some people get confused about the difference between a guest account, which this would be, or a free trial. But all you need to get started is actually just an email address. So that helps. Simply use your username or your email address to sign into the website. Um, and once you are signed in, you'll find your start page, which has a bunch of uh, quick, easy access links to things that might be relevant to you. But if you're just starting out, I would suggest focusing on the top left here, where you find the main parts of the website. So home, trees, search DNA, help and extras. And we're going to go through them in turn, except DNA, which we're not talking about today, really focusing on the genealogy side of things. Um, so Let's see, if you're just getting started, the first thing you might want to do is start your family tree. Um, by clicking trees, you get this menu. It'll look different since I have some family trees on here. But if you want to create a family tree, you can just click create and manage trees at the bottom here, which I'll do now. And it'll bring you to a list of all your family trees um, and trees shared with you. So you can simply click here to create a new tree. So we'll do that now just to show you how it's done. And the first thing it asks you for is the home person. So if you're making your own family tree, that would be you yourself. Uh, in this case, we're making a fictional family tree for a person called James Flibberworth. Um, he's living and male and was born in 1672, <laughs> let's say. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead. So now we have a home person. Now you'll notice this isn't actually saved as a family tree yet, just in case you're worried getting started. Uh, it's only when you add two people that we consider it a family tree and actually save it. So in order to move on, let's add James's father, um, Nathaniel Flipperworth, who was born in 1589. And you'll notice there it gave me a bit of a warning um, status required. You have to pick if the person is deceased or living. So for the home person, we'll assume that the person's living. Um, and for anyone else, you just have to select. And this is important because if a person is living, even if you set your family tree to be available publicly, we will make sure that information about living people isn't displayed to protect everyone's privacy. So in this case, uh, Nathaniel is, as you can surmise, deceased, as is his son. Uh, I didn't put that in though. Um, so now it's asking me if I want to save this tree. And it's also asking me, uh, do I want to allow others to view this tree? In this case, I've entered total nonsense. So let's not do that. <laughs> we'll keep that one private. And you can also read more about our privacy settings and such here, but let's just save this tree for now. Oh, there we are. 
So trees looking a bit different now. Um, but of course you can navigate. Again, this might be super basic and I'm sorry if it is, but we'll go through some other things in a moment here. Um, this is what the family tree looks like in one view. The pedigree view is this one. That looks like what we we're seeing at the beginning here. Now you won't see all the relations there. You will see the actual pedigree of the person you're viewing. Um, and if you click this one, the family view, it'll be more of a sprawling family tree, sort of what we associate with the tree shape, I suppose. Um, so we'll go back into family trees in a little bit here, but that's basically what you need to do over and over. Just click to add people to your family tree. And let's say we have something we want to add to Nathaniel here. When you click him, you get a bunch of options and you can go to his profile. And the profile, of course, is one of the main pages you'll be spending time on because you have facts about the person here. You can add sources, which are either records from uh, our databases or, well, any links, uh, anything you like, basically, to, to verify the information that you're adding. And on the right, you can see the person's relations. Now, beyond the trees, the thing you might spend a lot of time on is, of course, searching our records, um, which you can do by clicking search. And you get a fair few options here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between them. Um, when you click search all records, that's a good place to start, of course. Um, these will simply search records, but with a focus towards different types of collections. So beyond search all records, everything below here basically works the same, but it just is going into these different categories until you get to the end here with the card catalog, which is a very important feature that we'll talk about in a second. But for now, let's click search all records. And let's say we do want to search Nathaniel Flibberworth, even though that's a nonsense name that I just made up. I'm gonna guess we're not gonna find much, to be honest. Um, a good thing to think about when you're starting to search is when possible, don't enter too much information into the search fields, at least when you're starting out. Because say if I were to put in where this person lived and I added a, an event like the year the person was married and all of this, the search results will only include the actual records that contain all of that information. So say if I add the year that he was married, it's not gonna bring up his birth record because of course when he was born, no one knew when he was going to get married. So that information's not there. So it's good to start maybe with just the name and say the birth year, which I've forgotten what I put in, but let's say it was, uh, I'll just leave it empty. <laughs> See, I'm I, again, probably not going to find anything. No, we didn't because it's a nonsense name that I made up. So that's all very good. Um, let's see what happens when we type in James Smith instead. And now I'm searching very broadly, basically all types of different collections and we have about three million <laughs> records pop up and that's even excluding family trees and such so obviously a very very common name here um i'm going to go into one of these at random let's say the probate calendar here and so let's say this is a record we're interested in um, once we've got it opened up here, we can click here to view the record image in this case. There's not always going to be one, but luckily there is in this case. So we can click there or we can click here to save the record. So let's just make sure this is the information we want first and click to view. And that brings up the image of the actual record here. As you can imagine, quite a lot of Smiths. <laughs> yeah, this is what I get for <laughs> searching for Smith. Um, so these icons at the bottom here are quite useful. This one on the left will bring up the pages of the actual uh, collection that we're viewing right now. So we can flip through to a different page here, sort of browse it. And let me remove that. And this one can be used to make sure we're looking at the right James Smith, because in this case, there's obviously a lot of them. Going back to the... Uh, page we were at just a second ago, and I just used the left arrow there to move back. Um, let's say that this is a record that's relevant, even though it isn't. And then we can click save and save to someone in your tree. Um, and since we're working on the Flibberworth family tree, that's what we're going to do. So we realize now that James, because it was a ridiculous name, he changed his name to Smith. Uh, he figured he'd blend in better in, in real society. Um, so let's see if 
we can attach it to James here. See, so this is what it looks like when we're attaching information or a record to a tree. In this case, you can see on the left hand side, all the information associated with the record on the right hand side, just the stuff that's already in our tree. In this case, as you can see, the name is different. Um, so you might not see this very commonly, but just as an example of what it will look like, you get to pick what information you want to save here. Because for example, we don't have information on James's death. So it says new here, which means we're going to be adding that here to the profile in the tree. Um, but in this case, when it's different, and this can happen if there's a spelling variation, usually not as egregious as the surname difference here, just a slight spelling variation uh, might be it. But in this case, let's say we want to rename him James Smith, and we'll set that as the preferred name. Um, or you can select alternative name, which means that that's just selected as, we're still going to see him as Flibberworth, but because it's a ridiculous name, we're going to go with Smith and click the big orange button, save to your tree. See, now we're back at the profile and it looks a little bit different. So we can see the record has been saved and it's now a source here. Um, these dates have been added because they were in the actual document we were looking at. If we click it, we can see the connection. Now, as I said, you'll probably be searching uh, a lot on Ancestry and you probably probably at times will be quite uh, frustrated at not finding what you're looking for. Uh, that's all part of it, don't worry. Um, there's a lot of search tips available on our website as well. Uh, I won't go too much into it, but I did want to mention that if you're not finding what you're looking for here just by typing in information, you might benefit from going via the card catalog. And you'll remember that as the thing at the very bottom of the menu here. Well, not the very bottom, but almost. Let's open that up. It's equivalent to the card catalog you'd find in a library. It's a long list of all of our different collections. Um, and you can filter it, which is the useful thing really. Um, so the difference is when you're searching via one of these, you're searching all of our records, or in this case, all the census and electoral rolls, if you pick this one. Um, what you can do instead in the card catalog is go into a very specific record collection and open up exactly what you need and then search only there. So say you know the area your ancestor is from and you want to narrow that down first. Uh, you want to see is there anything in this exact collection that's relevant. And you can do that by using the filters on the left here. So first of all, this comes pre-selected because I'm at .co.uk. I'm going to unselect that just out of interest to show you the full thing. So we have different categories we can filter by. We have locations we can filter by and dates or decades. So let's say you're looking for immigration documents. You can simply click where it says immigration and immigration here. And suddenly we've filtered out all of the potentially irrelevant collections. Um, in this case, we know that we're looking for passenger lists. Let's say, of course, we can look for any of these, but let's say we were interested in passenger lists. And of course, we know we want to look, I'm just keeping this as the whole world for now. But let's say we're looking at the 1880s. And so there's still quite a few of these. So we might have to go geographically, I'll select Europe, and the United Kingdom. And that brings us down to just one collection. Um, the UK and Ireland incoming passengers list, uh, which does have 16 million entries. So it's quite a bit to be searching there. But this is a great way to figure out what collections might be relevant to you. And if you're just getting started as well, and you're interested in a particular area or year, um, you can do this same thing and check what do we actually have available from this time period and this place. Um, in this case, we can open it up. And so you'll see the same sort of search tools here, the exception being that we're now only inside this collection so that we won't see anything from anywhere else. And you'll also notice here on the right hand side, we have an option to browse the collection. So in this case, it's sorted by different ports um, and there's a lot to choose from. I'm just going to pick something at random here. Obviously you might have a better idea of what you're looking for. Apparently we only have these two years for this particular port and this month. Let's have a look and it'll bring you straight to the actual document. Um, one thing I wanted to mention as well here is that you can choose, like I mentioned, to save to a person in your tree. 
Uh, you can also save it to your shoebox, which is just for when you know you might want to reference the document later, but you don't want to attach it to someone in your tree. Um, and the shoebox can be accessed from the start page, so when you're actually when you just started signing in there. Uh, you can also save the actual image, um, which might be relevant to you, say you're taking out a subscription for a couple of months to find some records, you might want to save them to hold on to these actual records uh, after the end of your subscription period. So you can simply download it there. And of course, if you want, you can re-upload that as an image to your tree to make sure you're never gonna lose access to it. One thing you might want to do after you've done a bit of research is share your family tree with other people in your family or maybe with a collaborator who might be able to help you with your research. And you can do this quite simply by going to your family tree and clicking the share button here in the top right. Um, let's do that now. And it gives you a few different options. Um, so you can use someone's email, uh, a username or simply generate a link that you then send via chat or whatever you like. Um, in this case, let's say we're using a username. Uh, actually, let's use a link. This is a new feature and it's quite handy. Um, you can pick how much access to give this person. Let's say I'm sharing it with my uncle because he's a genealogy fiend and is going to be able to actually fix this tree that I haven't done any proper research on. So let's make him a contributor. And here you can see that I can pick whether I want him to see living people. So I will in this case, because we're gonna be collaborating on it. And then you can simply click create link. And all you need to do is copy this link. It's now being copied, so you can simply paste it um, into a message to, well, I can paste it into a message to my uncle. Um, or I can pick a username if I know that he has an ancestry account. I can enter his username here and again, pick what level of access to give. Or, oh yeah, this little info bubble gives you all the details on, on the different access levels. Um, or you can click email and enter someone's email. And if they don't have an account, they'll be prompted to create one. But as we said, all you need is an email address to get started. This is quite a short video and there are a lot of things I would love to highlight, but the main thing I would suggest beyond the basics of your family tree and of searching is our support center, which you can find under the help tab here and you can click support center. It's the first option here. And that will open a separate page here um, where you'll see a few suggested topics, but basically, any question you might have can probably be answered here. So say I shared uh, my family tree with my uncle, but he doesn't quite follow how to accept the invitation of the family tree. So I can simply type in share and it will pull up all the related support articles. And there are a lot of them. Um, let's see, sharing a family tree, we'll click that. And so it goes through exactly what I just told you here of how to share the family tree with pictures and everything. And then it has here how to accept a tree invitation. In the support center, you will also find, if you just type in getting started, you'll find a series of guides that sort of go through what I mentioned in this video, but in more detail. So five different articles here with just some information, ending with some search tips, which again, I think would be useful for most people uh, who haven't really had a chance to dig deep into how to use the website yet. So there's a whole wealth of information to be found in our support center on all these different topics. Um, but let's go back for the final part of the video. I wanted to show some troubleshooting steps that again can probably be, probably be useful um, as your tree grows bigger, as you import information, it might accidentally become saved to the wrong person. You might accidentally create a duplicate person and your tree might start looking a little something like this. Now, this is a broken tree. Um, this is a tree I specifically put together as an example of what not to do so I could learn how to fix it. And in this case, you can see that this person, Gustav Vossa, appears one, two, three times. Um, and he has the same birth and death dates. It appears to be his own son and grandfather somehow at the same time, which is not right. So if your tree is not looking the way you expect it to, um, here's a couple of tips to figure out what's going wrong. Um, the first thing you might suspect in a case like this is that there could be duplicate 
uh, profiles that have been created within the tree. So the same person, but they're, they've been entered twice. And that can be difficult to see from here because depending on whose perspective you're viewing the tree from, it can look a little bit different. Uh, but don't worry, it's uh, easy enough to fix. You can simply click tree search here at the very top right and then go to the list of all people that you can see at the bottom here. So this will give us a list of everyone that's in our family tree. And again, this, much like my uh, other family tree, is just nonsense. Um, so don't take any of this as historical fact. Um, but you can check here and see, are there multiple people with the same name? And this can get confusing because sometimes there are, but there should be, you know. <laughs> uh, in this case, we can see Gustav Vasa. He appears twice here. So we don't want that. Um, and you can see that one of them seems to have birth and death information in the tree here, while the other one is just blank. Uh, let's open this one, and we can do that by clicking. And we'll go to the profile then, and there doesn't seem to be much information on here. Um, but we know that this is not right, this is the same person. We've accidentally entered this as a spouse to this person at some point. Uh, and it's often hard to root out how these things happen, but we know how to fix it at least. Uh, we can go to the tools at the top right and select merge with duplicate. Let's do that. So you can now see a split where we have the person that we just looked at on the left, and then we pick who the duplicate is on the right. So I'll put in the same name. So this is the other profile with the same name. I'm going to pick that one. And in this case, it's much similar to when you're adding a record to a tree. It's asking you what information here do you actually want to save. And in this case, one of the profiles basically had no information, so it's no problem. But sometimes you might have added some records to one profile, some records to another. Uh, one may have gotten a birth date and year, and the other one just has the birth year. Um, so you can pick then on the right and left what you want to keep for each one. And then you click the, click the orange button here to merge them. In this case, it's easy because it's a blank profile. But now that duplicate profile will have been removed. Great. Um, and let's go back to the tree to check if that fixed it. I'll click again here, the name of the tree and view tree. And it didn't fix it. As you can see, there's still three of Gustav Vasa here, even though when we look at the list of all people, we will now find that there's just one. So how is it possible that three times the same person is appearing? Well, you can also see that it's the same picture on all of them. And I've only uploaded this picture once, so I know it's actually the same profile. This indicates that the error is caused by a relationship in the tree. So let's open this big profile that has a lot going on. <laughs> Uh, it's all incorrect, by the way. Um, so you can click now to examine what could be happening here. You can click Edit and then Edit Relationships. And that will bring up all the different links and connections that this person has. In this case, it may take a second because it's so broken. <laughs> Bear with me. Here we are. Yeah. So. The problem here, basically, is that these relationships are all wrong. <laughs> um, under the label of spouse, this person, Brianna, has been entered. Uh, entered, um, But she's also been entered as a child. So, bit of a problem. Um, let's remove this, because it's incorrect. So you can click the X here to remove this relationship connection. And it's asking if I'm sure. Yeah, and as it points out here, this profile will remain. It doesn't delete anyone, but it snips the family tree. So you're like Mr. Miyagi, trimming the tree, making sure that, <laughs> that no nothing is growing where it shouldn't be. But those branches will still be available inside your family tree, if any of this makes sense. So don't worry about it if it doesn't. You'll get there. Um, let's remove this relationship. And now let's close out this box of edit relationships. Now, honestly, I don't know if this will fix anything because as I said, I made this tree to be as broken as possible. So you see, now that looks a lot better. <laughs> There's still a lot going on here and a lot to be fixed, but those two things, it's remarkable how much they can fix. So if you go through the list of all people, make sure there's no duplicates. 
And then if there, it's still not displaying correctly, uh, you can go into all the profiles where it's displaying weird and check the relationships and sort of cut out any relationships that may have been double entered or similar. So hopefully you'll find some of this interesting, even if you're not a complete beginner, or if you are, like I mentioned, the support center is a great place to go for additional information. Finally, of course, the most important part, what is my accent? Now, it is a mix. It is uh, almost as broken as this family tree. I'm Swedish, um, but I grew up with a dad who grew up in the UK. So, and now I live in Ireland. So if you guessed any of those, you get a point. If you guessed all of them, you get three points. That's, I'm deciding the rules as I go. Um, but yeah, Swedish is, is the correct answer. Uh, well done if you guessed it, not a lot of people do. Um, and finally, if there was any part of this guide that was useful to you or new, I'd urge you to explore it. Um, let us know in the comments below what you think of it, uh, what you find. If you have any questions, we're here to help. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the comments. Bye-bye.